Hi, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Marshall. Welcome to Tumble, the show where we explore stories of science discovery. Today, we're following in the footsteps of dinosaurs. (laughs) Where are those dinosaurs leading us? Is it someplace good? (laughs) Yes, we'll find out how dino tracks captured in rock can take us millions of years into the past, revealing an ancient world in our very own backyard. Today's episode starts with a question from Walden. My name is Walden. I'm nine years old. My question is, how were dinosaur tracks made? So you mean like, how were dinosaur tracks made? Like, how did they get fossilized? Exactly. Why is it that we can still see dinosaur footprints that we know were made a long, long time ago? Well, let's ask our listeners, how do you think dinosaur tracks were made? And how would scientists find out? And also, what can scientists learn from dinosaur tracks? Take a minute to think about these questions, because soon we'll be back with one of the world's top experts on dino prints. To answer Walden's question, I called up Paul Olson, a paleontologist who is famous for his research on dinosaur tracks in the Pioneer Valley. Dinosaur tracks are kind of unique, right? Because they are the record of living, moving animals. That's an interesting way to put it. I guess other types of fossils might show you what they looked like, but you wouldn't have any idea what they were doing with that body of theirs. Exactly. Bones are not a record of moving animals, it's a dead animal. But footprints were made by a live animal. Footprints are not made by dead animals. <laughs> you, can, you can do it, but normally that doesn't happen naturally. That's one theory busted. No one was using giant dead dinosaur puppets. <laughs> <laughs> that probably didn't happen. That would be amazing. I mean, if it did, who's the puppeteer? It's a funny image. They'd be very big. <laughs> Assuming that didn't happen, dinosaur tracks have a lot of information beyond just where dinosaurs were walking. They show you exactly how dinosaurs moved. You can calculate how fast they were moving from the footprints. You can also tell what their posture was. You can also tell what kind of skin they had. And you can tell which kind of dinosaurs were in the same areas together. Well, that is a lot of information. Like You can tell what kind of skin they had? Yeah, some footprints are preserved so well and left behind such clear marks, you can see the scales on the bottom of a dinosaur's foot. No way. Yes, way. No. You way! (laughs) That's impossible. (laughs) It's true. They're there. They're in rock. And these sets of tracks or trackways are gold mines of information to help picture the dinosaurs that passed by millions of years ago. And unlike skeletal or bone fossils, paleontologists don't have to guess at how they fit together. There's something the dinosaurs made, not something we made. So they're really unusual in that respect. Yeah, so I guess when paleontologists put skeletons together, they're doing a lot of guesswork. But that brings us back to Walden's question. How did the dinosaurs make their tracks and why are they still here? Well, let's start with how all tracks are made. Dinosaurs would walk on mud just like any other animal would. Dinosaurs' feet squelched down in the mud, leaving an impression, just like when your own toes push into wet dirt or sand and leave a deep mark. And on the shore of a lake, when the water gets a little bit deeper again, that, that footprint, just made by a dinosaur, we covered by another layer of mud. And another, and another, and another. The footprint would be buried in these layers of mud or sediment. But before these layers piled on top of each other, a thin layer of algae settled in between. There's some little algal scum on the surface of the mud. And that actually acts as a separator. This algae, which you may also know as pond scum, helped preserve the footprint. That also holds the mud together when the next layer of mud comes in. And so this happens over and over and over again. In your mind, now fast forward through hundreds of thousands to millions of years. And basically, most of the footprints that are ever made on those surfaces are actually preserved. 
So where footprints occur, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of them. Oh, so wait, there's thousands and thousands of dinosaur footprints? Like, not just one in a while? Yes, which means if you find one footprint, you can find a lot. And Paul says they're still out there waiting to be found. And the only thing that limits your ability to see them is how much rock is exposed and how much surface you can see. Wow, so how do you find these tracks and what can we learn from them? That's what we'll find out right after this quick break. We're back. So we've learned how dinosaur tracks were made by dinosaur footprints getting buried and preserved by layers and layers of mud over millions of years. And now we'll find out how Paul got his start discovering fossils and what they've taught him about the world of dinosaurs. Is it that dinosaurs are cool? Is that what they taught him? <laughs> this story starts back when Paul was a kid reading his local newspaper. And uh, there was a little article uh, that somebody had found a footprint and given it to the local library. Now, Paul was a kid who was obsessed with dinosaurs. He'd spend hours at a time marveling over fossils at museums. So when he found out that someone had discovered a dinosaur footprint at a rock quarry near his house, he got there as quick as he could. And so I got my bicycle, and a friend of mine and I bicycled out to the quarry. Hold on. I mean, I, I think we should probably stop and explain what a quarry is in case people haven't heard that word. A quarry is a place where rocks are dug out, usually for construction. So kind of like a mine for rocks, and they cut them into squares and stuff. Yes. And if a quarry has the right kind of stone in the right place, it can be a gold mine for fossil hunters. I remember quite vividly walking into that site for the very first time and seeing people puttering around with rock hammers and breaking open the rock and looking for fossils. Wait, people just walk around with hammers breaking rocks and that's how you find dinosaur fossils? It's also how you take out your aggression. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. <laughs> no, it was like a little bit more subtle and complex than that. These were amateur paleontologists and they knew that tracks were hidden between the layers of rock in the quarry. These rocks had hardened from mud. They knew that if you broke the layers apart, kind of like peeling open the pages of a book, you might reveal a footprint. Okay, so it wasn't just like random smashing. Not at all. The crowd at the quarry took Paul under their hammer-wielding wings and showed him the secrets to finding fossils. And I learned pretty quickly that you needed to have the rock oriented the right way to the light so it cast a shadow. Paul would pick up slabs of sedimentary stone from the quarry floor or carefully excavate them from the rock walls. Then he'll angle them around to the light. And so he's looking for like a shadow that the footprint casts, like through the impression into the rock? It's a small shadow, but a footprint will stick out from the rest of the random bumps and patterns on the rocks. And using this technique... It wasn't long before Paul made his first find. When I found the first track, it was really exciting. Wow, so what was his first footprint? Well, they looked like bird tracks, but Paul knew that they were the right age to have been made by dinosaurs. And these were small, only a few inches long, but really obvious. And I was incredibly excited and came back almost every moment I could. So he'd been bit by the fossil bug, not, not like a fossil of a bug that came alive and bit him, but, oh, I mean, you know what I mean. I do. <laughs> <laughs> and then we started finding them all over the place, and over several years found thousands, actually. Okay, I mean, so this is just like he said before, like, if you find one track, there are thousands more waiting for you. So that must have taken a lot of time, though. I mean, thousands? Yeah. And keep in mind, Paul was still in school. He told me that all the time he spent at the quarry wasn't so great for his homework, but he was becoming a real expert on dinosaurs and making real discoveries. He was finding things that no one had ever seen before. One of the wonderful things about paleontology is you can make significant contributions by just discovering things. Sounds like he was discovering a lot of things. Yes. 
And those things made Paul even more curious about bigger questions. And I especially got interested not just about dinosaurs and the fossils themselves and the process of discovery. Sure, great to find a big dinosaur footprint, really exciting. But then I found I got really even more exciting about learning things about those fossils that nobody ever knew before. Paul wanted to discover new ideas about dinosaurs. Especially about the environment in which they lived, why the climate was changing during that time, why certain dinosaurs went extinct. All of that became at least as exciting as finding the fossils themselves. When Paul graduated from high school, he went on to a university to become an official paleontologist, building on what he'd learned from years in the quarry. You'd see these fossils, and in your mind's eye, try to imagine what the world was like. Well, so how do you do that? I mean, I, I get that tracks are fossils of moving animals, but how, how do you see what their world was like? That's a really good question. So Paul gave me an example from a track that he discovered recently in Massachusetts. There are footprints of one of these carnivorous theropod dinosaurs, except there's more than one footprint. So a carnivorous theropod dinosaur, that's like a T-Rex or something? This dino was not as big as a T-Rex, but it was a meat eater. It would have been standing on two feet and leaving behind three toed prints. And these footprints that Paul found are very unusual. They're overlapping each other and they're exactly the same size, exactly the same shape down to details of the creases between the pads of the feet. Wow, so they're like one footprint just on top of the other? Yeah. Yet, they're so clear, it's almost like the dinosaur left a fingerprint behind. It actually makes you a little bit dizzy because the footprints are so close to each other that it looks like you're kind of seeing double. So was he like, do I have double track vision? (laughs) Yes. And as we've mentioned, he's seen thousands upon thousands of tracks in his life. So after examining them closely, he realized something important. There's every indication it's the same animal. Whoa. The same individual who came back later in the day, perhaps, but it's following its own footprints. Maybe, I guess, like it lost something? (laughs) Ball has another theory. I suspect it's just going back and forth on the shoreline looking for fish. Wow, so the dinosaur is like pacing and looking out into the water to see if it can find a fishy. Yeah, just like modern day birds would. Paul says while the tracks are identical, he noticed a slight difference between them. They're slightly different in depth of impression, suggesting maybe the mud dried out a little bit. So maybe it was next day, but it had to have been very quickly. Very, very close in time. So wow, you can really just see what happened in a day for a dinosaur like hundreds of millions of years ago. Like just we can see it went fishing and (laughs) took a break and then came back and did some more. (laughs) Yeah, it's just like an average day, like my day as a dinosaur. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, did they take siestas? Is that what's going on? (laughs) (laughs) Maybe. So that's an example of behavior you would never know about without the footprints. Oh man, it's really incredible what you can learn just by looking at something and asking some basic questions like, what made these tracks look like this? Exactly. And Paul's been a paleontologist for 50 years now. This is what he's taken away from it. What I've come to really understand is that you can, by looking carefully, making careful observations, and running through ideas in your head and hypotheses of how things might be, you can actually figure out some very specific new things. That's really cool. And it sounds like it doesn't take a lot of fancy training or tools to make some big discoveries. Exactly. And when you get into the area of ideas, new things you discover, then you're thinking something and learning something about the world nobody has ever known. Nobody. And that's exciting. I just love that. These footprints that dinosaurs didn't even know they were leaving behind when they were stomping around on the banks of a lake or whatever. Now we can see them and they're just awe-inspiring to look at and think about. But what's even more amazing is what they can tell us about the past. 
It is pretty incredible, especially because Paul started finding them when he was just a kid. Which makes me feel like anyone could be a dino track explorer, like even me. <laughs> and that brings us to our big announcement. Yes, we are announcing Tumble's, Tumble's Dino, dino Map, Map Adventure. Adventure. Oh, good job being in sync on that one. Woo. <laughs> We've created an audio tour through the Pioneer Valley of Western Massachusetts, the place where dinosaur tracks were first discovered, which is amazing. They were first discovered right here in Western Mass and where you and your family can discover them for yourself. We are based in the Pioneer Valley and we've become kind of obsessed with the dinosaur history and heritage that surrounds us. That's why we've created a way for you to experience it along with us with help from New England Public Media. Marshall and I will guide you through the Pioneer Valley's best dinosaur sites, where you'll learn how to become a dino track explorer, searching for clues to the distant world where dinosaurs walk the earth, right below your very feet. And if you're not in the Pioneer Valley, but you are interested in dinosaur tracks, come check it out anyway. There's so much to discover and learn from the comfort of your very own home. The Dino Map Adventure is coming in October. Stay tuned for details on our website, sciencepodcastforkids.com. Thanks to Dr. Paul Olson, Professor of Earth and Environmental Sciences at Columbia University in New York City. Hear more from our Dinotastic interview with Paul Olson on the special bonus interview episode that's available to Patreon members who pledge at the $1 level or higher at patreon.com slash tumblepodcasts. <laughs> special thanks to Josh Smith of Phenomenon Science Education for fact-checking this episode. And Jessica Whiteside of San Diego State University. Sarah Robertson Lentz is our editor and designed the episode art. Elliot Hajaj is our production assistant. Gary Calhoun James is our engineer and mixer. I'm Lindy Patterson, and I wrote this episode. And I'm Marshall Escamilla, and I made all the music and sound design for this episode. Tumble is a production of Tumble Media. Thanks for listening, and stay tuned for more stories of science discovery. All right, everyone, here it is. End of the episode. You've made it all the way to the end. You listened to the whole thing. So that means it's time for our Patreon people. So first, to Liam, Baba and Maman and Neela love you so much. Because you love numbers so much, they came up with this cool joke. What did six say to nine? Stop being so upside down. Get it? Six, nine, upside down. Uh, it's a great joke. Anyway, wish you an amazing belated sixth birthday on September 11th. Cal, pal, mom and dad are very proud of the budding scientists that you are. Keep reading, keep learning, and happy birthday on September 22nd. A happy birthday on September 22nd as well to Emmy and Ellie. Mama and daddy love you more than all the stars and moon in the sky. Always keep exploring. To Jacoby, a happy birthday on September 23rd. Mom and dad love you so much and love how much you like science. I love that too. To Kieran, happy birthday on September 27th, bud. Everyone's so proud of the big kid you're becoming with love from Mama, Papa, and Cleo the Pug. Happy birthday on September 28th to Aaron. Your boundless curiosity and amazing sense of humor brings such joy to everyone around you. Mom, Dad, and Nora love you. Happy September 30th birthday to Phoebe. Your family loves your amazing curiosity about the world. And finally, a happy birthday on October 2nd to Claire with love from Mom, Dad, Graham, and Reed. Thanks to all of you and to everyone who supports Tumble on Patreon. If you want to get a birthday shout out of your own like these fine folks, simply support Tumble on Patreon at the $5 level or higher by going to patreon.com slash tumblepodcast. Once again, that's patreon.com slash tumblepodcast. 